him already. Dr. Dominic Bryan is Director of the Institute of Irish Studies at Queen's University Belfast. He tells me he's currently on sabbatical. I need to learn how the University of Ulster operates these. <laughs> but anyway, he's uh, currently um, engaged in intensive research work. His major research interests are around how, con how conflict works its way through public space. And some of you may be familiar with work that he's been involved in in the past around parades. Today he's talking to us on the subject of flags and he's also been involved in work on memorials. So thank you very much, Dominic. Lovely. Right, thank you very much, uh, Gillian. Um, I'm I've got quite a lot of information to get through here from a number of research projects and I'm going to try and bring them together. So I'm going to rush through some of the... Uh, um, uh, some of the slides. Um, much of the material that I've got is all already available online and reports that we've done on the Shared Future uh, website. So if you want to go back and have a look at some of the material, it, it can all be obtained. And also the Life and Times survey uh, material that I'm going to talk about. So what I want to what I want to do is, is, is tackle the flags issue and we've been involved for three or four, uh, well probably now five years in analysing various aspects of how flags and emblems are used in Northern Ireland. Um, and I want to, if you like, take it head on and try and bring together a lot of the material that we've got over the last few years and at times I think some of the evidence is going to mean we're going to need some very frank conversations uh, about it. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rush. I'll talk a little bit about the methodology but of the various material that we've done, but not a great deal. I thought I'd show you some pictures of flags to begin with. Most of you will be pretty familiar with them. I think we've got a, a, a collection of about 54 or 55 different sorts of flags that are flown from lampposts and other places around, uh, around Northern Ireland at the moment. I won't start to go through some of those, but many of you will be familiar with them. All right. Where does this work come out of? Well, it comes out of uh, work that we originally uh, did with the Office of the First and Deputy First Minister looking at the uh, flags issue, both the flying of official flags and, and the flying of popular flags, which was produced a few years ago in work Gordon, uh, report that Gordon Gillespie and myself did uh, called uh, Transforming Conflict. And that then went into the, uh, in part, went into the shared future uh, document. Um, as part of the discussions at that point in time, we had a, um, uh, it was decided there was a need for a sort of baseline study to look at the frequency of the use of flags, where we they were used, how long they stayed up. And um, uh, this this work originally came out of work funded by the ESRC, but I'm very grateful to the Office and for De First Deputy First Minister um, for, for helping us with this. And they provided the funding and the, and, 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 and the work is to go and provide some sort of a baseline to look at how Shared Future has worked over the last two and three years. Okay, so that's, the, that's where the research came out of. Um, uh, and as I'll, as I'll show you in a minute, uh, part of the work has been a survey of all arterial routes in Northern Ireland. So yes, twice a year we've driven every main road in Northern Ireland and counted every flag on every lamppost. All right, and I'll discuss a little bit how we did it in a minute. We had two census points, one um, at the beginning of July for reasons which would be obvious to everybody, and another one, and this is a little bit more uh, potentially controversial, in seeing when the flags were coming down, we decided that mid-September was a reasonable time to do the survey. And we might have a discussion about why we chose that date. But I'll, I'll get to all of that in a minute. Uh. Right, but before I, get into, before I get into all of this, I want to say things about how symbols work. Because I believe this is important, all right? Um, uh, because it, it, it reflects on what I'm going to talk about with the, w with the surveys from the Northern Ireland Life and Times. Um, uh, because in that, we're asking people's opinions about flags. And it's important to remember that meaning varies depending on the person who's looking at it. In fact, the meaning for a symbol doesn't come from the symbol itself. The meaning for a symbol comes from your own head. You're the one interpreting the symbol when you see it. All right? So the meaning of symbols are not fixed. They can change. They change over time. They change on the context 
with which you're using them. So, one of the outcomes, for example, of, of the survey that I'm going to discuss later could be that both the tricolour and the Union flag in certain contexts are interpreted by most people in Northern Ireland as paramilitary flags. All right? It depends upon the context within which they're used. And we can think of lots of examples, uh, you know, uh, the use of the swastika as a symbol. You know, if you're a Jewish comedian making a film, you can probably get away with wearing a swastika and making fun out of wearing the swastika. You know, if you're uh, uh, third in line to the British throne, wearing a swastika to a fancy dress party ain't funny. It's a very bad decision. All right. So depending on where the, co the context of the symbols, um, uh, uh, meaning is going to change. Symbols often have a whole range of meanings. Different people read symbols in different ways. There are lots of different psychological drives to how people read symbols. A lot of political actors use different strategies with the symbols. Um, it's a bit, oh yeah. um, and, and I'm going to discuss, because I think there are a range of strategies being used in how flags are displayed in Northern Ireland. Symbols are often things that bring communities together, all right? They give people a sense of belonging, all right? They are also used to control communities, to demarcate boundaries, to out other people, all right? So they both bring communities together and act to exclude other people, all right? Um, Power held by individuals and groups plays an important role in the strategies that followed, and I think that's a discussion we ought to have when I've shown you some of the material. And new symbols can be used in new situations. So we're in a, a situation, we're in circumstances of change. All right, and I just want to show you a couple of examples of how the context of the symbols are going to make a difference. Here is uh, the use, I have put this up because it's the use of the poppy. All right. Um, and we'll see people wearing poppies in the very near future. And you can see here how it's being used on a paramilitary mural. It's being connected to uh, national flags. It's also being connected to the UVF, a paramilitary group. All right? We can look at similar use of symbols here on a memorial on the Falls Road, the use of the tricolour flag, which is in the background, the use of the red hand, which some people often forget is often used by Republicans as well as the old symbol of, of nine county Ulster as well as a six county Ulster. Um, you can see in both those very quick examples how different contexts symbols are used in different ways. Okay, so I'm going to talk, there's three uh, ranges of research material that, that we've been involved in recently. Firstly, the survey of arterial routes, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Secondly, we've done a range of case studies over the last few years. I'm not going to talk about the five case studies um, that we did last year because we're still involved in some of the writing up from that. But we, um, we, we were involved in case studies in the previous report as well. So I think in all we've done seven or eight different case studies of different areas <coughs> now. And thirdly, uh, the Northern Ireland Life and Times Survey. And I'd like to thank the people from Northern Ireland Life and Times Survey for their work on bringing this material together as well. So broadly, I'm going to talk about the first and the third of these areas of, of, of research. And I'm going to throw a whole lot of figures at you, basically, and see what you think. Right, so let's start with the flag survey. They're the roads. All the, the, we were informed... Um, that the, the probably the best way of doing it was to do a research on the protected routes in Northern Ireland. Now, I'm not particularly clear even now what protected routes are, but the road service have designated protected routes. Um, and that seemed, we didn't really go into any analysis, but it seemed to us a good way of doing it. They had particular main roads and some B roads, and we decided to take their map, and that's the map of uh, roads that we were going to survey the flags on. And you can come back to me and talk a little bit about the methodology, but obviously we had to code different sorts of flags, all right? That would be one of the controversial areas. Decide whether a flag counted as paramilitary or not, for example, and find a mechanism for analysing the different sorts of flags we were going to look at. 
We had to make sure that it was a valid way of counting. And it may seem odd, but it's quite difficult sometimes, for instance, to decide whether the flag was on the main route or not on the main route. If you could see it in a housing estate from the main road, did that count as on the main road or not on the main road? And you'll know that good research means that if another researcher was going to come down and do the research, they should be able to replicate it. So we had to come up with a whole set of rules as to what counted and what didn't count so we could make the coverage as, as, as exhaustive and exact as we possibly could. We were only doing arterial routes. There were clear limits to what we're doing designated by the timing in which we were doing it. All right? And you've got to remember that by aggregating a big survey, you can't pick up a local, lot of local contextual factors. So we might have found an awful lot of flags in one particular area. All right? It could well have been that that year, in that, that area, a 12th of July parade was taking place. All right? And that would have been the reason. But when we're doing a big survey like that, we can't pick up all of that sort of stuff. Right. So remember, this is 2006. We're still putting the figures together for 2007. All right. Um, what did we find? Well, I'm going to rush through a whole load of figures for you. Over 4,000 political or party symbols on arterial routes and town centres. 90% of them are loyalist and unionist, and under 10% were nationalist and republican. Remember, we're doing this at the beginning of July. 3,500, or 90.8% of which were displayed from lampposts and telegraph poles. Of those, 178 had evidently been in place from the previous year. We took, a, we took a rough estimate of which ones looked so old they'd been up from the previous year. 194 paramilitary symbols, including 133 flags and 29 murals. All right? Almost half of the total was located in the Belfast local government district area itself. Um, though some other areas had quite high ratio of paramilitary uh, symbols. All right, so then we went to do the second survey, covering the same area, revisiting all points noted in phase one, um, recounting all items, noting all new manifestations, trying to work out overall which flags had been removed, which new ones had gone up, and what was the persistence of them. All right. Um, in fact, that, I've got that up as 2007. That should be September 2006. All right, when we did the second survey, 2,500 2, political emblems on display, suggesting 40% decrease in the symbolism. So 40% had, uh, we were 40% less than we had before. Now, some of the loyalist and unionist ones had been removed, and we had a whole new set of Republican and nationalist ones because we just had the anniversary of the hunger strike. All right. So we were able to judge how many, what, what was taking place there. 1,754 of the emblems were unionist and loyalist, indicating a 53% reduction in these symbols. So around half of the flags have been taken down. 181 loyalist paramilitaries. Uh, so the, de de the decrease in paramilitary flags was only 29%. In other words, they were taken down less often than other sorts of flags. Um, most interestingly, the biggest decrease was in flags associated with the loyal orders, orange flags. Flags around orange halls were almost always removed on time, okay, which, which raises interesting things. And, and I've been talking to the Orange Order. This isn't an issue, in a way, in one sense, for the Orange Order. Around their halls, the flags were almost all gone by September. All right. 737 of the emblems in the second round were nationalist and republican, indicating an increase of 87%. But of course, you've got to take into account it was the 25th anniversary of the hunger strikes. All right, we weren't so so it was just a week or two after the end of those commemorations that we were doing the survey. That said, we did some small surveying later on, and quite a lot of the Republican hunger strike stuff was still up in December and January and February, particularly in West Belfast. I, as a rule, we've noted that tricolours often do get put up and taken down in a much shorter time period, all right? But quite a lot of the hunger strike stuff material from the previous year, that didn't happen, <coughs> all right? Um, small proportion of Republican paramilitary flags doubled. Right. Um, all right, quick summary of findering. Findings. Overall, there was a reduction in political symbols, um, though this was, there was some flux in different areas. 
Loyalist symbols decreased while Republican symbols increased, but as I said, the time period taken um, probably uh, um, uh, is why you get those figures. National and regional symbols decreased more than did paramilitary symbols, so that's Union flags and Northern Ireland flags tended to get taken down more regularly than paramilitary ones. Loyal order symbolism was removed most systematically. Flags displayed on private houses were, were removed much more often than from lampposts, and I'll come to what that tells us about things. Um, and the reduction varied quite considerably across geographical locations. So what were the key issues that we drew out of this? Firstly, people taking responsibility. Flags on private homes, flags on orange halls, um, were most often removed. Flags on lampposts were least most often removed. So clearly one of the issues is about people taking responsibility for the things that they put up. All right? um, a number of loyalist areas didn't take their flags down until October and November. Most distinctly, Sandy Row, the Shankill, and the Newtonards Road all had their flags up still when we did our survey. This year, they were nearly all down. So it would suggest, without having gone through the figures this year, are going to look much better. So one of the issues is, well, yes, people are taking the flags down there, but the flags are staying up, still staying up for a bloody long time, and well after what you would even define as the marching season. At least they did in 2006. Which brings us to the, one of the key issues. What do you consider to be... a in terms of the use of the flag, something that reflects a celebration and commemoration on what is left up to mark territory and how do you define those two processes. All right, and I think that's a key issue and I'll come back to that. Um, we did note the use of quasi-official flagpoles in some towns and villages where flags had been less often put up but there was now a sort of two or three flagpoles in the middle of greens and the flags were on there and some of those had paramilitary flags on. Now I know of some of the, from some of the case studies that this has been used as a sort of uh, way of reducing the number of flags. I'd like to raise the question as to whether that's, that's a, a really acceptable solution and I've spoken to a number of people who think that that's not the way to go, uh, to go forward. But we can discuss that as well. Also, and many of you will know this, the number of memorials and sacred ground sort of spaces being developed is a real issue in quite a number of places. So, um, that, was the, that was what came out of the 06 report. Let's see. All right, now I want to try and compare that because there's some really interesting figures that come out of the Life and Time survey. And we had, there have been flags questions in before but we've had, we had some new ones put in with the help of the people at the Life and Times survey. All right. And there are some st quite startling figures to look at. All right. So let's look at a couple of ones that have been in before. Uh, has there been any time in the last year when you personally have felt intimidated by Republicans' mural curbstones uh, paintings? What the, the striking thing about those figures is you look at two... Th for, for, for Protestants 2005 and 2006, and you've got a reduction of half, which would suggest that people are feeling less intimidated um, by, uh, Protestants are feeling less intimidated by Republican stuff they're seeing around, or they're feeling it less often, or they're seeing less of it. All right, which is quite a, quite a striking figure, that. And similarly, if you talk about intimidation from loyalist murals, curbstones, paintings or flags, you also see a reduction in the levels of intimidation, not quite as big as the, uh, the, the, the reduction in uh, the, the other figures for, for Republican stuff, but nevertheless a reduction. So those figures, at least, and, and you know, I won't go into debates about how effective surveys can be, and there are, are often problems with figures, but they at least do give us an indication that people are feeling less intimidated by some of the displays that are taking place. However, if you like, that's the good news. All right. The likelihood to shop in neighbourhoods with displays of loyalist flags or murals. All right. You can see that the, there is a, a, a very big figure uh, on that top line of people who are less willing. You know, 
A total of nearly 40% nearly of people, 37% of people are less willing to shop in areas where they see loyalist flags and murals. Now that figure's obviously higher for Catholics than Protestants, <laughs> but people who ask, does it make an economic difference? These figures would say, absolutely it makes an economic difference. All right, similarly, if we ask the same question of displays of Republican flags and murals, we get a similar sort of result with a total of 42% people less willing. Um, obviously, again, that's high, on this occasion it's higher for Protestants and Catholics. On both occasions, you have a small figure for people who are more willing to go to areas when they see the flags and emblems, but those figures are very small. So, does this thing make an economic difference to areas? The survey would seem to suggest absolutely it makes a difference. Uh, this is perhaps the most startling figure that we came up with. Opinions as to who usually puts the Union flag on lamppost. And we offered a number of options. We offered Union uh, display, uh, uh, sorry, displayed by the town council, displayed by political parties, displayed by cultural groups, displayed by paramilitaries, displayed by other groups, and put up by isolated individuals. And you can see the figures for yourself. Most people, when they go around and see a Union flag on a lamppost, assume it's been put there by a paramilitary group. Which brings me back to my suggestion that in certain contexts, a Union flag is read by people as designating a paramilitary area. Not loyalty to a throne, not any of the other meanings you can take up, but demarcating a paramilitary area. And if we ask the same question for the tricolour, we get the same answer almost exactly the same answer. Interestingly, the figures for political groups, which is the second one along there, um, is higher, and that probably something, at a guess, something to do with the perceived relationship between Sinn Féin and the IRA. Okay? But that middle figure of, relationship, uh, of who you think puts the tricolour on lampposts, the answer you most often got was paramilitaries, by some distance. Right. In general, do you or would you support flag flying on lampposts in your own neighbourhood? All right. Enormous figures saying no. All right. You can see the Catholic and Protestant figures there uh, moving up to 80 over 80% for Catholic and just under 80% for Protestant. So we thought, right, they're interesting. Let's break that down a bit. And that's by social class. All right. And even if you take SE, S3 as the nearest you'd get to working class, you still have in working class areas over 75% of people saying they do not support flags flying in their areas. So we thought, well, it'd be interesting to do it by political party. All right. Do you support flag flying in your area? UUP, 84% no. SDLP, 97% no. DUP, 64% no. Alliance, 97% no. Sinn Féin, 75% no. Even the PUP was 75% no. Although I have to say the survey showed that was based on a survey of four people. So <laughs> we, I, I, can't, um, I can't say how, uh, how accurate. What you can say then, to put it even further, actually before I go on to that, to put it even further, even if you take working class Protestant areas, Judging by the Northern Ireland Life and Time survey, most people in working class Protestant areas do not support the displaying of flags on lampposts. That seems to be the message coming from the survey. When do you think it's legitimate to display Union flags on main streets? All right. Uh, a few weeks uh, around the special events, we had 30, do we have a total of 44%? Never we have a total of 32%, and it depends, a total of 12%. All right? Only 3% of the population suggested they supported the displaying of flags all year round. All right? So the strong, there seems relatively strong support for displays of flags for only a couple of weeks a year. I regret not putting in a category, actually, of three or four months in that. I, I might, it would have been more helpful if we'd broken that category down a little bit more. The same for a tricolour tricolours being displayed and we get very similar uh, results. Sorry about rushing through this very quickly, but get it in there half an hour. So, what are the observations? What are one of some of the conclusions that I think you can make out of this? Because I was quite startled by some of those figures, I must say. They, were, they, were, they showed stronger 
leanings than I had expected to see. All right? And the first one I think is absolutely vital. All right? We have to stop talking about flags and emblems being put up by communities. They are not put up by communities. They are put up by groups and individuals. We need to look through the policy documents and every time we see the word community, we probably need to cross it out and put group in. All right? Because there doesn't seem to be any, any evidence from here all right, that communities en masse are putting flags up. That doesn't mean, firstly, that communities, some, quite a few people in communities don't support it. They do. And it also doesn't mean, of course, that groups don't have rights to do it, to express their identities through the displaying of flags. So this is not to suggest that people don't have the rights to do it, but it is to suggest that the idea that whole communities do this is not borne out by the evidence that, that we have in front of us. All right. In fact, the Life and Time survey suggests that the practice of flying of flags is just simply not hugely popular in any sections of the population. All right. We do see uh, and have seen a reduction in paramilitary emblems and, and, and symbol symbols around the place. We're doing this year's survey um, and we're going to know fairly shortly um, how big that reduction has been. There has been I have to say that in our first look at the July survey, it wasn't as big. I heard it talked about quite a lot, but the figures don't seem to suggest a huge reduction. But that, but in, and, and stuff we've done, it, it is looking like there is a reduction. Um, I'll come to the protocol if people want me to talk about it some. That's the police protocol on, on flags. Um, but some of the outcome has suggested that it, it, it has had limited influence. And I talk about some of the details of that in reference to the figures we've got if people would like. All right. I would underline that in all of the work we've done, the importance of working with local groups on the issue is absolutely vital. Working in partnership. I'm not suggesting by this that you need some heavy-handed sort of policing towards these issues. Working in partnership, agencies working together, multi-agency works, comes out time and time again the most successful way of dealing with, um, uh, dealing with the problems. All right, so let me just finish with what I think are the key issues. When commemorations, celebrations are taking place, we need to find ways of making sure that people take responsibility for the displays that they want to put up. All right, because the evidence suggests that when people take responsibilities, they put things up, they take things down. All right. Second, is the time period flags are up. And here's where I think a really interesting debate could be had. Because of course the, the, sort of the, the, the protocol at the moment suggests that we should be ridding arterial routes of flags and certain areas of flags. And I'm not sure that that's going to be doable. <coughs> arterial routes are parts of where people live. People often want to put displays up in very public spaces. I wonder whether the real issue must come down to time, to the length of time displays are let, let up. Now, we took in a time period of two months. We sort of, I suppose, gave you the marching season as a, as a period. Now, even that, I think, is a pretty generous way of looking at how displays are made. Most places, displays around celebrations and commemorations usually go up for a week to two weeks in time. And I think more important than the spaces they're being used is the time in which they're up in the spaces. All right. So my second key issue is time period. And my third key issue is the nature of shared space and the difficult discussion that we need to have about which spaces we use. And at the moment, there seems to be an acceptance that in residential areas, you assume that certain flags and emblems are all right and we're neutralizing town centers a little bit. And I understand the reason for that policy, and I understand why councils are taking that sort of approach. But the evidence also suggests that an awful lot of residents in a lot of these places do not like flags and emblems up in their area. And ironically, there is a reasonably good argument for saying that if people want to express their political, religious uh, identities, or national identities, then in some senses, town centres are the place for that. 
That's where you have freedom of assembly. That's where you allow these sort of expressions to take place. And actually, residential areas are the wrong places for that to take place. They're, they're, residential areas are precisely the areas where actually intimidation can take place. Now that, I think, is one of the awkward things because in how we're interpreting the sh shared space and shared future at the moment, we're almost in Northern Ireland, we almost do it the other way around. Keep those identifications to your residential areas, make the shared space neutral. All right, so I think that's quite a big question that we might, li uh, what we might like to uh, take up. So that's my 30 minutes, that's me, that's me finished with evidence. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Dominic. That was fascinating. I really wished I hadn't limited you to 30 <laughs> minutes. <so. laughs> I was dying to, to hear some more detail. But I know that many of the things Dominic has raised um, are points where you may have views, comments, or want to ask for a little bit more detail on some of the some of the the items and the statistics and so on that he's presented. So with that, I'll just open the floor. We are recording this seminar, and if you're comfortable and have a question and, and want to identify yourself, that would be great. Uh, but I would ask you to wait to get the mic, please. Okay, so comment, observation, point of clarification. about uh, town centres. Right I understood your very last point about town centres um, being neutral spaces or shared spaces. Of course, there is a difference between neutral yes. and shared. Yeah. Uh, neutral is possibly the first step towards achieving uh, true maturity of, of people being respectful of each other. Mm. Um, I just wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I do. I mean, you, you, the, the, the difference you identify, Ray, I think is very important. And um, I mean, I've been thinking about this because I don't think, a, I don't think a, probably a future any of us want in Northern Ireland is to neutralise everything. I don't think we can. I think people's senses of identity are too strong to do that. Um, and, and therefore, I think, I think the issue about making spaces neutral is problematic. I think, I think if what you're suggesting, and I think it's probably right, that neutralising space is part of a stepping stone towards being able to share space, towards being able to accept the use of each other's symbols without feeling threatened, All right. then I think that's probably the route, it's the route we are going and where we need to go. But we need to recognise from a policy point of view but where we want to get to. The danger is that we, that we stay we the neutral space thing becomes the norm and I think if we end up there then we haven't actually achieved what we would like to achieve but as I say the the, the other side of that which is which is which is worrying is the acceptance that certain residential areas it's all right to do certain things because hey that's a Republican area or that's a loyalist area all right and in, in quite a number of issues that is effectively what takes place. It is how the situation is policed for obvious reasons because it's somewhat easier than to, than to say, do you know what, maybe that paramilitary symbol is not acceptable even if it's in the middle of the shankle. All right, because a lot of evidence would suggest there's an awful lot of people in the shankle that find it unacceptable and feel intimidated by it at any time. So that's the other that's the other side of it. And I, I would also just add there on the paramilitary symbolism. What I said about symbols changing, if the context changes, is as true of paramilitary symbols as it is about the Union flag and the tricolour. So just as I'm suggesting that, do you know what? Often the Union flag and the tricolour could be deemed a paramilitary symbol used in certain contexts. It also means that if the contexts are made different, then those symbols that are now often viewed as paramilitary and potentially unacceptable or illegal could be viewed as not unacceptable in the future. In other words, if you do change the context in which you're using, and obviously one of the examples is, is the UVF, 
all right, and the, f and, and the relationship of the First World War, if you can change the context, that doesn't mean that, that people are always going to see some of those symbols as threatening. So, so I think it's really interesting to think about the way the context and the, the centre of town one seems to me a very good issue to, to concentrate on. Michael Wardlow of the Council for Integrated Education. Mm -hmm. I question just, um, when we're setting up new integrated schools, one of the <coughs> most difficult discussions is around the name of the school and the badge. And it's fascinating how people reconcile those, creating a new emblem, mm. which they both are three, if you think of incomers mm. now, can actually say, we can identify with that. There's something different about identifying with past symbols. Mm. Now my struggle is a bit, are we trying to get to a place where all symbols are equally valid and people can do what they want and hopefully they'll not have to fly them any longer? Or are we actually at a place where we're looking for, can we get something new that we can all aspire to? Because I honestly think unless there's a policy context for this, we're lost. Because mm. I'm really not sure what a safe space would look like. And I don't mm. think there is such a thing. I think in different places, it has to be negotiated in different ways. And I think what Ray said, this notion of in some places, it will be neutrality until people have, I don't mean to use the word pejoratively, the maturity to look at other things. For example, if we have a, a, a local control school that wants to become integrated, inevitably one of the first things is, can you fly the union flag? Uh, yeah. Can you play on a red, white and blue football jersey? All the symbol stuff. So I guess what we're finding is, in the absence of any shared vision about what these things might look like, do we struggle to try to find something new? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the new symbol, so I'd really like you to talk a wee bit about this idea of, of new symbols mm -hmm. rather than maybe always trying to look back to the old symbols. I'll tell you, Michael, what I think the, the answer to that is. And that is, you, you, you will end up, and you can end up with both. That in fact, it's the, very, it's the very development of either new symbols or new events that people feel part of and get bring, brings you together that creates relationships which allows those very same people to express those other identities, those long-standing identities. So that if I, if, if to take another example, and we've, we've done work with the, the, the Belfast City Council on St. Patrick's Day uh, uh, as well, um, and I I'm not going to talk particularly about St. Patrick's Day, but if as a city you're coming together as a people and you feel a sense of Belfast belonging, all right, if you can promote that, it seems to me that one of the possible outcomes <laughs> is that you will also get used to the fact that parts of your city have different identifications. You know, it, the, the, the same way, to, to, to put it very bluntly, the way, the way football fans of, of, of separate clubs on one Saturday are shouting against each other and are, are mortal enemies, and then when their national team, you know, if it's, if it's Manchester United and Manchester City, and then England are playing on the Wednesday, you've actually got another event which is bringing people together, all right, which is creating relationships. So I think the answer is, is both. I think you do need new symbols, you do need new events, you do need ways of bringing people together to share space, when not just mixing space, but when you're doing it together. And if you do that successfully, it will probably improve your chances of having other events which are more particularist from one side to the other as not being threatening, particularly if you're seeing people who you know you share this city with, for example, all right, they're down there as, as Irish people or British people, but you have a relationship with. So I think my answer to that would be, if you're good at doing the new stuff and bringing together, it will make some of the more particularistic views of the symbols easier to deal with. Uh, Pamela Matthews, Community Relations, Banbridge Council. I was interested, Dominic, and you, s you talked about very briefly about the flags protocol mm. and about it, it not working to the extent maybe that it should be working. I was interested in finding out a bit more about that. Well, I mean, some of this is work. I don't want to talk about it too much because it, 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 some of it's work we're still doing with OFM and D DFM, all right? But what's clear is that in some contexts it has worked quite well and that... Um, police have become quite engaged in certain things and, and, and some t they haven't. And, I mean, in a way, that's no surprise. What it, is it ever different with, uh, with, 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 with policies? All right. I, I mean, 
I would be quite frank in saying the fact that things like the protocol don't even appear on the PSNI website remains, to say the least, odd. All right. In other words, there's always been a problem, and, and this was what we, 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 we identified in the original Transforming Conflict report, which was well known. I mean, it's not as if we discovered it. All right. Agencies weren't working that well together on this issue. And to a certain extent, not surprisingly, everybody wanted to pass the buck. All right. and, and I think we all know that that's gone on quite a lot. And I think, let's be honest, we can all have some sympathy with the worker on the ground that wants to pass that buck. Um, and the protocol was about trying to make that uh, work more successfully. And I think the answer has been it has done that to a certain extent. Where's one obvious way it hasn't worked? All right. The councils aren't involved. I mean, that's the partnership protocol doesn't yet involve local councils. And, uh, and I mean, it seems to me that would be one obvious way of, of bringing it together. The, the councils seem to me the organizing bodies in many ways which would be best, best at relating with all the agencies. Okay. So, so and, and the other thing I would like to say about the protocol just, just to me is that it does, that it, it's got, it's quite good at laying out areas where, you know, arterial routes that should be free from, from, from symbols. And what I'm suggesting is that I think now would probably be a good time to sit down and think about what is realistic on that. And what, and, and, and what, what you heard me suggest is that, is that I think the time factor is probably a more successful way of doing this than necessarily some of the space things. So um, um, we're still going through some of the stuff on, on the protocol, so I don't, want to, I don't want to go into it in too detail, but there's some of the, thi there's some of the issues that I think are coming out of, of looking at how the protocol is working at the moment. Uh, Phil Graham, Sorry, yeah. um, I'm in several charities and we never have heard of this research. Why haven't we received? And I'm also a student, so why haven't we received? Well, it, some it's it's um, it's got plenty of it's it's had publicity and it's on websites. It's on the shared. If you look on the shared future website, the research is all. Um, is all there in reports and all these figures can be got hold there. I mean it was it's quite interesting when you do publicity on these things um, uh, the uh, uh, sometimes the press things you think are really going to go for they go for it and actually when some of this stuff came out I was surprised the press didn't. I was all I have to say sometimes quite relieved that the press don't go <laughs> mad over it because um, I've had some bad experiences in the past. I mean when the transforming conflict report came out a unionist uh, politician got hold of a copy before and the and the newsletter <coughs> ran on new Queen's University report says union flag to be banned on the 12th which which was complete shite and there was nowhere in the report you could possibly read that into it nevertheless I, f I felt that unionist politician probably wanted to, to get themselves on the front of the newsletter but it, it's, it's available on the shared future website and on the Irish studies website <coughs> okay Uh, Michael Hamilton, Transitional Justice Institute. Dominic, this is just a more of a curiosity, but I'm wondering how much the people that you're dealing with, the various actors involved, actually see this as a rights issue. Um, I suppose, I know that the most of your survey material is quantitative, mm. but you have obviously been dealing with, with the various actors, and you spoke yourself of the right to express mm. your identity. But I'm wondering, even in terms of those who feel intimidated, are they expressing that mm. as a, you know, as the agreement, for example, talked about the right to be free from sectarian harassment and so yeah. forth? Well, well, I think that's. I mean, it's interesting that when we have talked to various people about these things, I mean, people do now begin to understand that they have the rights that are expressed their identity. In a sense, that's one of the reasons people make an argument for for, for being able to do to do this and you know hey it's a very valid argument you know and I think we must take on board um, um, that that people do have the right to express their identity and should be allowed to do so however I think there is a problem in residential areas all right and some of these figures would suggest that there are people who at the very least 
do not like the displays and I suspect more than likely some that feel somewhat intimidated. Now the difficulty is that some of the form of policing that we now do except, seems to me to accept the status quo. All right? There's no breach of the peace. All right? Therefore, the flying of that flag is not something that we're going to necessarily engage with. However, there might not be a breach of the peace because there might be people around who are feeling too intimidated. So, whilst I think, and in a way, in a way, that's why I, I raise the possibility that displays and things that are, are often better in the centre of towns and in those sort of public spaces than in residential areas. All right. So I think it is absolutely a rights issue and I think in that sense it falls into the same category as the parades and the whole way we're dealing with, 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 with public space. And I don't know, I mean the difficult question is to ask how that falls into intimidation when by the very nature of intimidation people are usually not, do, usually don't want to go up and, and put their head above the parapet and say something about it. And I think, think that is a very difficult issue. Rebecca, excuse me, Rebecca Dudley from the Human Rights Commission. Uh, Dominic, really interesting research. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm just trying to follow your, the implication of the center town argument through. And it does seem to me to present an um, inconsistency if you look at the economic impact yeah. data that you presented as to whether in fact that would be a logical course of action if there is an adverse economic impact by by allowing those expressions of identity in mm. the center of town? Well, <coughs> there's two answers to that. Firstly, people have rights to express, express their identity and the shops and businesses have the right to run their businesses, but the right to run a shop and business doesn't seem to me to override people's right to a, an identity. You know, the town centers are to be used by everybody. They are commercial spaces, but I think it would be a very sad day if we let the major companies rule the roost of what, what happens in our town centres. So I would suggest that, okay, if you argue that the 12th of July or even, I mean, even the figures on St. Patrick's Day would suggest that traders in Belfast don't, do not do fantastically well on St. Patrick's Day. All right? Is that a reason that people shouldn't have their St. Patrick's Day in the centre of the city? It seems to me no. All right, so firstly, the use of the centre of that city should not be overridden by an economic argument. What I'm saying about the residential areas is also, I'm not necessarily saying that you shouldn't have those expression, but what I'm saying is that the evidence would suggest that if you're leaving those flags and emblems up for months, then you are probably, or possibly at least, let's put it possibly, having a, 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 an economic impact on those areas. And you can think of areas Obviously, like, I mean, I, I can think of one area where you've got businesses that struggle, and that's Sandy Row, which are close to the town centre and have some, some class little shops. I mean, if anybody goes with their kids to Reed's, uh, Reed's Shoe Shop down there, you know, it, it's, a, it's a, a sort of business that anybody who wants to get shoes would want to go to. It's a great shop with great service in when you go to. All right, well, this year it had half a dozen UFF flags flying opposite it for about two months, you know. And, and I think that's the sort of issue we need to be dealing uh, And that's not therefore saying, because, you know, the, it's obvious to me that the residents of Sandy Row, most of them enjoy their 12th of July parade. So I'm not saying that that shouldn't happen, but I am saying that if you're leaving the flags up, for a long period of time, relatively long period of time, there is evidence to suggest that it is going to be ec economically detrimental. And that in, in, in many ways then, if you're looking at it as a rights issue, you've gone beyond your right to celebrate your, your identity and you've gone into another sphere where you're affecting the rights of others to too great an extent. Yeah, the question I was interested in was knowing more about the condition of flags because certainly some years ago 
one of the big arguments, and I'm based in Derry, mm. London Derry, was about the very poor condition of a lot of the flags that were flying and about how that was, you know, a lack of respect for the particular flags you were flying and how it was sort of bringing down neighbourhoods and indeed some of the main arterial routes. I mean, to some extent, my just my own observations would say that the conditions of flags have improved um, to, to some extent, certainly in the areas I'm in. But at the weekend, I was in mid Ulster and noticed very oh, dilapidated yeah. flags. So I'm just wondering if you can say a bit more about the condition of flags and, and whether that actually impacts. So if I'm resident somewhere with crispy, clean, spanky new flags of whatever sort, do I feel better about them than I do if it's sort of really run down and battered? Well, one of the things that we've, we've worked out is that some of the flags are so poorly made by a factory in Taiwan, which is where they tend to come from, that actually they do sort of self-destruct by January anyway. <laughs> and I suppose if you took that further, you could work out flags that would actually only last for six <laughs> weeks or something, and that would solve everybody's problem, oh, wouldn't it? I mean, it's a technology <laughs> idea, I don't know. You know. Or if it rains, it sort of dissolves or something, but that wouldn't mean they'd last for more than two weeks, two days, two hours, but anyhow. Um, <coughs> it's extraordinary how, how we treat, given the conflict here, that we treat our national flags with such a lack of respect is really quite bizarre. If you compare it with the US, where not only if you put a flag, your US flag up on your house, not only do you not leave it up um, uh, for any length of time, you don't leave it up at night. You take your flag down every night and an, uh, an American flag should not be left up overnight. And it should be folded in a particular way. And if it becomes tatty, you've got to fold it in a way and you've got to burn it. And there's particular rituals for burning the flag, all right? To, and the ashes then have to be treated in a particular way. Now, <laughs> in certain respects, I think they're quite mad <laughs> in that. You know, I really do. Um, and of course, there's great debates in America, and there's a couple of wonderful books on flag burning disputes. On, on the laws in various states that have been introduced over whether you have the right to, 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 to burn the American flag. But in a way, um, and it's quite interesting to look at different countries in the world because a lot of different countries have different attitudes. I mean, and some you could say, take your national flag and slap it on, on some bananas and saying, you know, the, uh, as a commercial thing or whatever item. In other countries, to use the national flag to sell an item would be seen as absolutely terrible. So it's quite interesting to compare that. But what you can say here is that given the conflict, people treat the flags with an incredible disrespect. And I think one of the things we can argue, and I think it's particularly interesting for organisations like the Orange Order, which feel... Uh, obviously feel the importance of their loyalty and their royalty in the flag. I think in terms of them designating or saying what the 12th should be about, one of the things that they could do is, 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 is highlight how important it is to treat those symbols with some, um, with some reverence. And of course it's also interesting that people who put their flags on their houses and on orange halls take them down and the reason is bloody well obvious, in part because they want to use them again next year. And if you leave them up, they become tatty. So I think it's all a part of that respect and responsibility aspect of the thing. And, and, you know, it, it mustn't be about, because if we make this about trying to reduce people's identity, if we make this about threatening people, and so often that's where the parade stuff ended up, if we do that, we are not going to get anywhere. We end up in battles. And, that, and we know from the last 10 years that that is not a clever place to be in. So it can't be about threatening people's identity. It's got to be about um, finding ways of people expressing their identity, helping people express their identity, providing people with options. In the end, that's got to be a better method than, than saying, look, this is terrible, you've got to stop that, or using, using heavy-handed legal uh, mechanisms, except there are some times when the police have to become involved. I mean, it's got to be about not threatening people's identities. You've had an easy ride so far. <laughs> no, Dominic, it's just uh, following on from those previous two questions there. Um, David Robinson, sorry, Belfast City Council, Good Relations Unit. Um, can you say something, Dominic, maybe about, there is a certainly an enthusiasm for putting flags up 
And in a sense, you know, it's a bit like, you know, town centres putting up their Christmas lights. There's a deadline there. Um, and you need to get the flag up. And then once the event happens, the enthusiasm for taking them down might not necessarily be as big as the enthusiasm mm. for putting them up was. Um, and I suppose, just can you say a bit about that? And also as well, I any engagement that you guys have with people or groups who put up flags? Mm. Because um, some, of the, some of that sort of reasoning and thinking might be very useful to, to enter into the debate. Well, uh, yeah, I'll say t two things. I mean, firstly, I mean, election posters are another good example of things that people are very enthusiastic uh, putting up. And when suddenly you've had the election and either won or lost it, the thought of going round. Now, a lot of the big political parties, of course, pay companies to go and take them down. All right. So there is a question there. Now, an, at least one council that I know of, but probably others, on a couple of occasions has taken the decision of, you know what, it's September, if we go and take them down, nobody's going to worry too much. And they've gone and got up the cherry pickers and taken them down. And of course, usually nobody has worried too much because, hey, it's September. All right. And there is one argument for saying councils could go and do that. But of course, that's all out of the public purse. That costs money. So I'm not sure necessarily councils taking a decision to clean these things up, or, or as they might do with graffiti, for example, is the way forward. All right? we, we, we actually, you know, a lot of these events, including bonfires and things, cost the public purse a pretty bloody big amount of money as it stands. All right? um, so I do think that's an issue, and I think what we need to do is think about, I mean, you know, if you were putting to me what would be a good way forward, it would be people putting the flags back up on their houses again. And it would be the traditional Ulster way. The flags go on your house and not on the lamppost. If you really want me to push on something, wouldn't that be a good thing to encourage? And maybe another way of doing it would be saying, for instance, for the 12th of July, can we lose the flags on lampposts, which aren't an age-old tradition in Northern Ireland, actually. And much of it has taken place post-1990s. And maybe we can think a way of getting some orange arches back for a couple of weeks and saying, look, structurally doing this in the Shankill Road or something like that. Now, they disappeared because of planning permission. All sorts of so I think there are ways that we can think of around um, those sort of things. Now, sorry, I should have written down. Your second question was around... Yeah, I mean, I think one of the interesting things to come out of the engagement is the role of bonfire committees for example. I mean, if you're asking who's involved in putting flags up, I mean, many of you know um, it will vary in different areas. Um, but, you know, are paramilitaries frequently involved in various guises? Of course they are. All right, is it always them? No, it's not always them. Bonfire committees are often those. And what's been interesting in a number of council areas is that council's work with bonfires has led on to talking about the flags issue. And, and we've come across that in a number of places, so that engaging around issues around the bonfires, which are another example of the same sort of practices, has led to work on um, looking at, uh, at, at flags. Do you know, I mean, I, on a number of occasions when we've engaged with people, people have, been, have said to us, they've, they've been quite frank, they've said, we do it because we're marking our territory and we want to make sure them is over there know where we are. On a couple of occasions, we've got that quite blunt answer back. All right? And I think you've got to engage honestly with people on that, as to whether you think that's acceptable or not, or why they feel they need to do that. All right. <coughs> For most other occasions, people are saying that they want their celebration, their commemoration, they want to do it in their traditional ways. And equally with that, I think you sit down and you talk to people about the way that that's taking place. And it has to be said, there is quite a bit of evidence out there at the moment that that sort of engagement is working, that people are trying to do things, that things are moving on. I mean, I, I wouldn't like to make this, if I've made this sound too negative, then I'm sorry, because a lot of groups are doing a lot of good work um, uh, around this sort of thing. And, I, you know, the main thing is just to encourage and try and help that sort of work take place. Okay, well, I think we're going to I think we'll, st we'll stop at that because lunch is ready and I know um, some of you have to get back to your offices and so on. But I'm very grateful to Dominic for a very interesting and obviously topical.